What are we playing? <laughs> yes. What else could we be playing together? Football, which is what I would call soccer with your head, that one? Yeah. That sounds like it should be headball, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Uh, ping pong. Checkers. Chess. What else? Backgammon. Backgammon. <laughs> What's that ball that you hit back and forth across the net that you leap in the air? Volleyball. Volleyball. And so on. Things we do together with our physical bodies <clears throat> that bring delight and joy. Oh, for goodness sakes, I forgot. Poker. <laughs> <laughs> and various card games. And Scrabble. Do you, is that the name of the way you call that game here? Alphabet. 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 <laughs> Alphabet. I can understand that. I'm very terrible at Alphabet. I always lose. And I here I am a writer and everything. I always lose. I never do know how to put those high letter words on those high numbers. Oh well. So these kinds of things bond us and connect us, even if we lose at volleyball, football, poker, and Alphabet, which I always do. <laughs> So it, it makes a group feel happy and feel good. It tends to make people feel gratitude for each other and gratitude to be in this group. It <coughs> tends to make people feel trust for each other. Gratitude and trust, when felt in the body, produces a neurotransmitter called oxytocin. For a few minutes, and then it dissipates as it goes through the bloodstream. And oxytocin tends to create a sense of trust and connection and harmony and gratitude. So, uh, trust and gratitude, gratitude creates oxytocin and oxytocin tends to create this. <coughs> And that tends to create the kind of trust that's needed to have in a community. So essentially, the component that Community Blue creates for us in community is a sense of trust. Now, there are things that happen in community that erode trust. Perhaps you have experienced that. Have anybody? Show of hands. May I see hands? <laughs> ah, yes. And may I see hands of those who've experienced trust and connection from doing pleasurable things. I'm glad to see more hands. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have any comments before we go on? Or questions? Oxytocin also makes you healthier, rejuvenates your body. That's right. Let's say this is your immune system on a scale of 1 to 10. Thank you very much for saying that. There has been uh, medical and scientific research that shows that when you connect with people in a group, your health, your physical body health is higher. Your immune system functions better. And if you are an older person, you, um, you naturally have greater health than you would if you were an older person not living with or connecting daily in a social way with other people. My mother, who is 97, maybe the oldest living eco-villager, mm. or maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> but in any case, um, my mother adores living at Earth Haven, where she has friends that connect with her every day. You forget hugs. I forget. Ha we forget hugs and to be close to each other. Hugs. It's basically, did this be nobody said? It's very important. That's right. Um, in fact, hugs kind of goes along with all of this. So I want you to tell you about a TED talk. Uh, there is a, an American medical researcher named Dr. Paul Zak. His last name is Z-A-K. And he does research on oxytocin. And he wrote a book called The Moral Molecule. And he says that oxytocin produces in us treating each other better with more kindness and more empathy and more connection than when we don't have oxytocin. oxytocin. So, empathy is another of the beneficial byproducts, and you can watch this TED Talk by putting in TED Talk 
Dr. Paul Zach oxytocin or any of those and you'll get to see it and he's very charming and he makes a good case for this. So we know about community glue. Some people who are new to community or newly starting and are still in the study group or still haven't lived together, when they think community, what do they think? They think this. We're standing in a meadow holding hands. We're singing together. After which, we go into our dinner of freshly baked whole grain bread and warm soup where we have a wonderful meal together. Somebody's laughing because she lives in community and knows that I'm being just a little silly. And then we go into our very well-run meeting where our well-behaved children are in another room playing quietly <laughs> while we make decisions in a harmonious way and then we all live happily ever after. <laughs> Take note of those who are laughing, they live in community. <laughs> It's not always like that, which is why we have parts one and three. Okay, so the third part of the things that I think are really important for community is a good process and communication skills. So if you would kindly write that in this part of your little chart. So what does that mean? That means that when we're talking to each other in the garden, when we're in the coat room putting on our shoes and coats, when we're in the kitchen working, when we're working together, or when we're playing alphabet, or when we're playing soccer, uh, football, we are um, speaking to each other in ways that are courteous and have goodwill in them. When we're in a meeting, sitting around together, to make decisions, I'll make these little dots be all of us sitting in a meeting. Here's the facilitator, here's the minute taker or note taker, and we're having a meeting. We are talking to each other courteously when we agree with each other, and we're talking with each other courteously and in goodwill ways when we are not agreeing with each other. So we are not eroding all this wonderful trust gratitude, empathy, and oxytocin that we created when we were playing football earlier that day. So how do you know how to do this? When one lives in community, oh wait a second, I have to ask my expert advisory board for advice. Will you please raise your hand if you live in community and have for more than a year? Can I see some arms, please? Okay, you are my expert advisory board. Please remember yourself. Okay. Um, do people in communities naturally speak better than they do in the outside culture, oh, expert advisory board? <laughs> <laughs> Notice they're laughing. Thank you, expert advisory board. I knew you were going to say that. Let's see what happened to the bottom of this. Oh, behind the chair, thank you. Okay. People in communities quite often tend to speak to each other more uh, more discourteously and harshly and unkindly very often than they would if they weren't living in community. That sounds backwards, doesn't it? How can that be? Well, it's probably because community is like a magnifying glass that magnifies everything in our life. So if this was our eye, over here it's really big it's been magnified and everything that we might say or do uh, is a lot bigger because we have more stake in it it's so significant have you noticed that and I think it's because when people think the word community their subconscious mind projects onto it emotionally charged important meanings Many people think that what they're going to receive from community is um, complete acceptance at all times and always to be listened to when one speaks and always to be seen accurately and always to be heard accurately. Our expert advisory board are cracking up because they know that that's not what happens. And, um, and also people expect to be included 
perhaps hugged eight to 12 times a day, which <laughs> can happen, certainly. Um, and so there's a lot of charge on it. Also, how many people in here would like to have a better world than we have right now? Politically, environmentally, and in every way. <laughs> this is extremely important to us, isn't it? Or would we have come all the way across Sweden to this part of Sweden and all the way across the Baltic Ocean to get here? It is because it is because we want a better world and we're willing to put our bodies and our euros and our and our crowns and our dollars where our mouth is. We're willing to put our life into the thing that we care about so much. So you might say we have a bit of emotional charge on the topic. Do you think so? Do you think that might be true? So people tend to get really upset when people want to do a different thing than we want to do or they don't want to do the thing that we know would be really good for the community. Has anybody experienced that in the community? May I see a show of hands, anyone? It tends to be charged, right? Therefore, we need better processing communication skills than we would ordinarily have. We have to be better at this thing called human life on planet Earth. Human life on planet Earth is hard enough as it is. Look at the kind of place we live in. Some countries are horribly militaristic. I live in one, to my great shame. Some countries are very materialistic and co commercial. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> what are we good at in my country? Innovative ideas, perhaps I can make that claim. Um, so, some of us live in countries that are very conservative. <laughs> like a cool wave, perhaps. Um, some of us live in countries that are saying to our governments, no more telling us what to do, government. And now that we don't have that government and we have this one here, do not talk to us about group anything. I'm talking to my friends from the East now, which folks from Czechoslovakia to Russia have said to me, you know, it's really touchy over here to have a group of people get together because we don't know what they're going to do. We kind of don't want anybody telling us what to do, including each other. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is important to know. This is important cultural information. So people in the West, especially the far West, like where I'm from, um, tend to have a really hard time wanting to cooperate with others because, you know, <laughs> nobody tells me what to do. And people from the far east and the east and the middle of the east tend to say, <laughs> don't tell me what to do. <laughs> so we need to learn better process and communication skills than we just generally have. So I recommend two really good ones. One is nonviolent communication which I think is very, very well known in Sweden already. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. How about Latvia? <laughs> is one here? Do, do people know about nonviolent communication there, do you think? No. No, okay. No. We can change that. <laughs> uh, Estonia? Yes. Yes? Ah, oh, good. Would you please take a visit over to Latvia? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Russia? Yeah? Oh, good, good. Uh, okay, do we have folks from other Baltic nations yeah. here? Poland. Poland? Yes, we know. Ah, very good, very good. Finland? Finland! I knew there would be Finns here. Yeah. Who said that? Hello. Ah, uh, good, excellent. All you folks need to talk to Mark <laughs> and tell him about it. Our, is, I asked somebody this. Is, is Finnish and or Estonian... No, Latvian isn't in that language family, is it? No. Okay. Well, there goes that idea. <laughs> there are nonviolent communication trainers all over the world, and they're trying to get to every place because this is such a beneficial meme. Do you know that word meme? I bet you do. Do you know that one? No. It's a newly made up word that means a little piece of information that like a gene, as in genetics, gets into a system and then affects the system beneficially. So one of the, the most big memes that we ever got in the human race was fire, you know, making fire, and then right after that comes the invention of the wheel. 
because as soon as you see these things, you think, oh shoot, I want one of those. And then we, it, it spreads through cultures. So the idea that uh, community is a good way to live is, is a meme, as is the meme of nonviolent communication, which is a way of speaking to one another that increases harmony, trust, and especially empathy, and reduces disharmony and conflict. So, in English, we call this for short NVC, but what is it called for short in Swedish? Same. Same? Okay. Or Kiraksporka. Kiraksporka? Did I just swear and say bad words? I'm so sorry if I did. Yeah, giraffe language. Giraffe language! Alright, I can relate to that. Okay, I'll make this green because it's so green. <laughs> okay. All right, the other one that I highly, highly recommend is called Restorative Circles. And it comes from NBC, and it is a uh, conflict resolution method. Restorative Circles. So may I ask, is that known in Sweden? No. No? Restorative. You might have heard the expression re restorative justice. No? OK. Well, all of this is Googleable on English, and chances are it's in Swedish also. And I'm not sure about our Eastern friends, but I'm guessing that it soon will be known. It's now used in municipal governments and court systems in 17 different countries, possibly more by now. It was created in the middle 90s by a British man who was an NBC giraffe language teacher who, who uh, lived in Brazil and his job was to help the urban gangs in the favelas of Brazil not kill each other, which is a lot to ask because that was their habit. And so he created the Restorative Circles Meeting, which is a group of people in the whole community of people involved who sit in a circle and give support to the parties to a conflict, creating reparations and restorations, giving apologies, doing something to make up for what they might have done, and then doing something more just to restore, restorative circles, to restore goodwill, if possible. It's extraordinarily successful. So before I learned about it, I was suggesting <coughs> various conflict resolution methods for communities, but I knew darn well they didn't work all that well. Because as soon as you did one, whoops, the next day there would be some more conflict, and it was just so hard. But this tends to work very, very well, so I highly recommend it. And who knows about it generally is NBC teachers. So it's one of these memes that's not as big yet as NBC, but I think it will be. Okay. Any comments or questions before we go to the mysterious number one thing, which might surprise some of you? <laughs> Anything about NVC, restorative circles, uh, good methods of communication? Okay. Um, Anna, would you please tell me, now that we've moved ahead, how much time do we have until? Um, 1.45. 1.45? Okay, great. This is, this is fine. Okay, uh, in a, as soon as we talk about this one, I'm going to suggest we stand up and stretch so that you don't get too tired of sitting, and then we'll just keep going. Okay, so um, I wonder if we could have uh, somebody who does not mind being silly in public make a drum roll. <laughs> or you could use your feet, like this. <laughs> from my continent, okay? Yes, it does. 
Are you surprised? No? Yes? Expert Advisory Board who's lived in community for more than a year. Does this sound vaguely familiar to you? Can I see a show of hands if so? A few, a few shy hands went up just a little bit. <laughs> what did you ask about? If you live in community for more than a year, chances are you might know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you haven't lived in community yet, chances are you might think, what in the world is she talking about? This is some strange American thing. No, actually, um, effective project management is extremely important because starting a community requires good management skills, and maintaining and keeping it going requires good management skills. It requires structure. <laughs> <laughs> agreements, clear agreements in writing, bookkeeping, cash flow projections, things that involving your country's uh, income tax, uh, how to fill out those forms and send down the right amount of money and how to fix your legal entity so you don't have to send in too much money. Um, it requires people who have leadership skills who help organize other people in terms of the workflow and, um, and the flow of money and the flow of information, keeping everybody absolutely transparently aware of what's going on in any of our committees or teams. Good management. Well, what is management, really? What is management? Um, it's organizing the flow of work, keeping track of who's doing what when by what time, organizing the flow of money, how much money do we need at what time to pay for what, and then where will we get some more, like a strategic plan. And we need to do that when we're starting the community, if we're going to acquire land, or purchase land, or rent land, or maybe not land, but a building in a city, because of course communities can be urban, or in a small town. Borrowing money, perhaps, to pay for it. Keeping track of the payments that we pay to the person or persons or institution from which we borrowed that money. Perhaps having another source of income as a backup so that if we can't make the payments to whomever we borrow the money from, we will not lose the property. Maybe we have a cushion fund for paying out our uh, property payments. And we have an awful lot of things to do, like we need to get permission from local government authorities to do certain things on our property. <coughs> Uh, we have this word in American English called zoning, which I don't know if you have a similar word in your various countries. That means the rules about what you can and can't do on property in your area. Is there some term you have? Yep. You would think whatever that term is in your language. They call it plan. They call it what? They call it plan. Plan. A plan, yeah. General plan. Is that what you said? Detailed plan. Yeah, detailed plan. Uh huh, uh huh. Uh, so there might be uh, an area of a small town with some of the countryside around the town and maybe the, the planners and the government officials of this town or this region or this county, depending on how you, what terms you might use, makes rules that in this section here you can do agriculture and have one house. In this section here it's uh, businesses only and you can't live there, you can just have a business there. This section, you can live there, but you can't have a business or a farm. No chickens in your backyard. I hope that you don't have rules like that, but some places do. And, uh, and they make a map of the different parts of the region that they're in charge of for what you can and cannot do. And sometimes people who create eco-villages and communities need to get uh, what can be called a zoning variance or a change in the rules or an exception in the rules so that you will be able to do that. Well, that's a whole lot of project management right there that you have to handle. Not to mention, what do people pay who are joining this group? Why are they paying anything? Well, they need to pay back the cost of the land and the development, the down payment and the payments to the annual, um, 
to the person who it, person or institution who's loaned the money if they didn't already have all the cash. Some groups have all the cash, some groups have to borrow. Uh, some people borrow from one, the quiet hours, the dog policy, the parking agreements, how we choose members, the financial agreements, what we need to pay every year if we do, how much work we need to do as our labor contribution. And then we find, to our astonishment, sometimes people break those agreements. They don't pay or they don't work to the degree they should, or they uh, play their music after 10 o'clock, or they let their dog do this and that and that on your little home site, and to put their dog on a leash or inside a fence, uh, breaking our agreements about dogs and cats. And when, when people break the agreements, what do we do? Many communities find themselves feeling helpless because they have nothing in place to deal with accountability because it didn't occur to them. Remember, when they were uh, here, <laughs> it did not occur to them that they might ever have to think about this. So I have two handouts which I will happily send you. Uh, one is called How to Help People Stay Accountable to Agreements and the other is called A Graduated Series of Consequences. In mainstream culture, consequences are jail terms and punitive fines. In communities, we don't want to shame or blame people or hurt them because they are our brothers and sisters in communities. So what ways can we have a graduated series of things we do to help a person who's having difficult being a responsible, accountable adult? How can we help that person finish the growing up job that their parents didn't finish and they left to us to finish on their behalf? Do we have to help some people in community grow up? Yes. We're all each other's parents, often, in community. I have become quite a bit more responsible since I joined my community because I got to find out where I was not. Oops. Feedback. Best thing in the world. Ouch. Okay, any other comments about these 19 steps? Astral hand, and I'll look at it with my third eye. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, me too. I was the most surprised person in the world when I found this out as I was researching for my book. I was such a countercultural person, I never actually owned a pair of nylons or wore finger paint in my whole life. You know, finger polish. I don't even know what you call it. I never even started drinking coffee. I just hit the ground running as a countercultural person way back in the 60s. And uh, so what did I find out? I found out that all the same things that work well at a business or a nonprofit is what we need to do in a community. I did not start out thinking that. What self-respecting hippie would think a thing like that? Certainly not me. But it turns out I want communities to succeed. What works? What works? And I want your communities here in this beautiful country of Sweden and all around the Baltic nations to absolutely thrive and succeed so that when you go into your community, after you've been away, you walk in and you go, oh, home at last, where it feels so good.